Hi guys, welcome to this set of videos. And now we've come to our fourth and final type of conic section here in chapter nine, section five. We're going to take a look at hyperbola. All right, objectives are exactly the same as been for every section here in this chapter. You will need to be able to write the equations for hyperbolas and you'll need to be able to graph hyperbolas. Just a real quick reminder what a hyperbola is. We're talking about conic sections. We're to that fourth type of conic section, hyperbolas. And the way that you get a hyperbola is that you take a conic, which is two cones, put tip to tip, and you're gonna divide it with a plane that runs vertically through the conic section. And essentially what you're gonna get, I showed you what it would look like earlier. I'll do it for you here again. What you're going to wind up with is essentially parabolas that are opening away from each other. Now, they're not exactly par parabolas, but they'll look like parabolas, right? You'll have a parabola up here, a parabola down there. They'll be opening away from each other, and they might look something like that, right? That's kind of the idea of a hyperbola. Parabola up here, parabola down here. Of course, those that hyperbola could be oriented horizontally, which parabola over here parabola over here. Anyway, that's the way this conic section works. This is essentially what the graphs are going to look like. We'll get lots of practice with that when we start graphing. Again, you will have two forms. You're going to have one that is centered at the origin. Where H, K, is 0, 0. That's why there is no H and K. There are zeros and so they just drop out. And then you'll have one where you do have H, K. This one is centered at H, K. And of course the orientation could be vertical or horizontal. So let's go ahead and take a look at a uh, diagram of what these, are, um, these hyperbola are going to look like, which I've got for you on this page right here. All right, so the hyperbola, a uh, quick definition for you, because I'm sure you guys probably, I doubt many of you have seen hyperbola before. Okay, kind of a lengthy description. Let me describe for you what is going on here. Um, so let's just say I pick some Point. I'll pick some point on my hyperbola. Let's call it that point right there, that point right there. What you're going to do is you're going to find the distance from the foci, right? You have two of them, a foci there and a foci there, the distance from the foci to that point. So I'm going to have this distance right here and this distance right here. And what the definition tells you, right, is that is the set of all points that is the absolute value of the difference of those distances. You will take this distance right here. Remember, distance or difference, difference means subtraction. Find the distance from this foci to that point, subtract the distance from the point to this focus, and that'll be a number, right? That number is now a constant. Whatever number you get for that difference, it's going to be the exact same number you would get for, I don't know, let's choose this point down here. Take that distance, subtract that distance, you'll get that exact same number, all right? That's always a constant. So that's where these hyperbola come from, those uh, parabolas that look like they're opening away from each other. They come by finding that constant value that is the difference of the distances from the foci to that particular point on the hyperbola. All right, so now that we know, you know, sort of where these guys come from, I got a bunch of stuff in here. Okay, first of all, the dotted lines in red, they are guidelines, all right? They're guidelines. We will draw these guidelines because they will help you draw the hyperbola. So this rectangular box in red, we will absolutely be drawing that box. The dotted lines that run through the box, which are asymptotes, we'll talk more about that in a second. You are familiar with asymptotes. We saw them in the last chapter. These are slanted asymptotes. Yeah, yeah, you remember that from last chapter? All right. Same thing here, except it's way easier to find here in this chapter. Anyway, here's the way this is gonna work. Please notice that the box 
goes through the vertices, right? So that rectangular box goes through the vertices and through the co-vertices, right? So we'll just draw a rectangular box through the vertices and the co-vertices, and then the way that we find those asymptotes is those asymptotes run diagonally from corner to corner through the box, corner to corner through the box. As always, just like with parabola, the hyperbola must go through the vertices, must go through the vertices, and it cannot touch the asymptotes, right? And you'll see way more of this when we start graphing them on our own. Now, we do change something here with ellipses, the major axis and the minor axis. Well, we've changed the names. Here, the major axis, the axis that has the foci and the vertices on it is going to be the transverse axis, right? Called it the transverse axis. The transverse axis will always have the vertices and the foci on it. The vertices and the foci are always on the transverse axis. They're always on the same axis. If you wind up with vertices and foci on different axes, you messed up. But why? Why would we change the name? Why not just continue to call it the major axis? I'll talk about that in a second. The minor, or minor axis, sorry, not minor axis, the conjugate axis has the co-vertices on it, right? The co-vertices are on the conjugate axis. Now, here's why we no longer call it the major or the minor axis. It is for this reason. It is possible, it is totally possible, in fact, we'll look at some example problems where it happens, that the conjugate axis is longer than the transverse axis, right? What happens is that transverse axis is shorter, the conjugate axis is longer. What that'll do is it'll give you this really wide hyperbola, right? Those parabolas will be really, really wide instead of kind of narrow like that. And so that's why we can't call it a major and a minor axis because it is totally, unlike with ellipses, it is totally possible for hyperbola for the axis without the foci, right? The foci are on the transverse axis. But if the conjugate axis is bigger than the transverse axis, right, that means the foci are on the shorter axis. So we couldn't call it the major axis because it's not big, it's, it's smaller than the, right? So that's the reason why we can no longer use major and minor. So we switch it to the transverse, which will always have the vertices and the foci, doesn't matter the length and the conjugate axis, which will always have the co-vertices, and again, it doesn't matter the length. This could be the longer one and this the shorter one. We'll look at some example problems where this is the longer axis and this is the shorter axis. None of that matters anymore, um, so that's why we don't call it major and minor. This is, of course, oriented vertically, ugh, vertically, horizontally, horizontal, and your formula sheet tells you that that is going to be x squared over a squared minus y squared over b squared is equal to 1. Again, the reason for that, right, is because x is oriented on the transverse axis and a is the distance from the center to the focus, right? So we need to make sure the distance from the center to the focus, which is a, is underneath of the x because I'm oriented on the x-axis. The y-axis has the orientation of the conjugate axis, which is the distance from B. B is the distance from the center to the covertice, so the B's got to go under that guy. But then when we go down here to the uh, vertical, now it's going to be y squared over a squared because that transverse axis is now on the y-axis, the distance from the center to the vertex is always going to be a. So now the a is underneath the y, and I have x squared over b squared is equal to 1. And again, the length of the axis doesn't matter. All you care about is which axis has the vertices and the foci on it, right? That's going to be your transverse axis. That's going to be the variable that comes first, right? If that, ver uh, that focus and vertice, vertice and focus are oriented vertically, the y will come first. If that focus and vertice are oriented horizontally, the x will come first.
Okay, so that's essentially what I described for you guys right down here. How do you know whether it's the transverse or the conjugate axis? Figure out where are your foci, right? Your foci and your vertices will always be on the transverse axis regardless of how long they are, all right? And then over here on this page, a couple more things about these hyperbola. There it is, right? Pythagorean theorem coming back, the relationship between A, B, and C. And now the nice thing about hyperbola is these guys all keep the exact same meaning. For ellipses, C was the distance from the center to the foci. Well, guess what it is here? C is the distance from the center to the foci. Fantastic. When it came to ellipses, A was the distance from the center to the vertice. Well, look at that. Distance from the center to the vertice. And in ellipses, B was the distance from the center to the covertice. And isn't that nice? It means the exact same thing here. The only difference now is this, right? The distance from the center to the hyperbola, that's going to be what we call the transverse axis. The distance from the hyperbola to the co covertices are now going to be on the conjugate Um, yeah, conjugate will be on the conjugate axis, and the foci will always be on the transverse axis. If you wind up with foci on the conjugate axis, you done goofed. Go back and figure out when, what went wrong. And then finally, one last thing here, I just kind of point out again that idea that um, the hyperbola come from finding the absolute value of the distances from one foci to the point minus the distance from the other foci to that point. And of course, we take the absolute value because distances can never be negative. And then last thing for you guys here before we jump into these problems, once again, you've got two charts to give you the information about these hyperbola. One is centered at the origin, this chart's origin. This one's centered at HK. And then once you know, is it centered at the origin or centered at HK, am I centered horizontally or vertically? Horizontally or vertically? And again, everything is based on the values of A, H, K, A, B, and C. Right? Check it out. C, A, B, B, A. Same thing up here. Down here, centered at HK, H, K, there's C, there's A, there's B, right? It's just those guys running around all over the place. So you got to find the values of A, H, and K. You got to find the values of A and B, and then use those to go ahead and um, just follow the formula sheets. Plug and chug, don't fat finger something on your calculator, and you should be good. I'm really excited to take a look at these hyperbola with you, so head on over to the next page of the notes. We'll jump right into doing a couple of problems, and I'll meet you guys there.